And if you wouldn't mind identifying yourselves as you speak, uh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I'm Harold Leach, and uh, my wife Mila was an Andover graduate in the very end of the 1970s. Welcome back. <laughs> um, John, you probably uh, knew about something called genetic programming in computers not too long ago, but the idea was to try to learn from evolution, come up with a, a fitness criteria, and then jumble up the sort of artificial genes of computer programs, the, the statements, and throw it all out there and see which one works the best. Then the next generation, you take some from each, jumble them up a different way, and hopefully you get closer to your goal. Um, but you have to define your goal. And that, I guess, is the basis of my question, that um, do we have one or a tiny number of goals? Do we have um, the sense that we know when we're getting closer to our goal? Um, and how do we allow for um, you know, variation and uh, you call it creativity, but um, some have defined creativity as putting things together that haven't been put together before. What a lovely question. Uh, if I might use this as a way to draw into the conversation, someone who's not yet been on the stage today, but Trish Russell. Um, Trish is the Dean of Studies, but she's also a teacher of biology and chemistry. Um, this whole genetic programming thing might resonate for her in that sense. Um, but Trish, you have the responsibility at this school of overseeing our academic program. Um, you have done an extraordinary job in the day-to-day -day, uh, form of that job, but you also have been guiding this process along with Caroline and others. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind taking a crack at that, that question, whether on the specific genetic programming front or even just more broadly? I would be happy to, and I, I, I think there are long-term benefits to the kind of teaching and learning that's going on here and that will be going on here that are impossible to measure in the short term. But just from looking at the number of you who've returned, who are graduates of this institution, I know we will be seeing that for decades to come. Um, and even more now in the era of the Tang Institute. A couple of quick anecdotes that I think illustrate your point, though. What goes on in the classrooms, we want to see how that impacts how kids are behaving and what their interests are and what they want to participate in. So we had some kids last year, for example, who did a global health project in their Bio 100 class, which is ninth grade biology. And a group of kids chose to look at what are the health concerns here on campus. They chose to do their global health project on looking at Phillips Academy students. Some other kids who were in that class last spring have just come forward and put a proposal. As Janine Coe was mentioning, a lot of students are worried about health and mental health in this age group and particularly on campus. These kids have now put forward, these are two 10th graders, have just put forward a school-wide proposal totally outside of an academic realm for how kids can access peer mentors, perhaps, and also connect with health professionals on campus. So how kids use what they're learning in class, I think, is one measure. That's one, you know, that's, that's the day-to-day -day success. I think so our alumni body, <laughs> our students and what they're interested in day-to-day, -day, and what our faculty are interested in doing. And right now, the faculty is energized they want to participate. It's a team of learners. And that also is how we will measure our success. If I might make a small addition to that, maybe, and we'll pass the mic a couple rows back. Uh, I think there might have been a hand uh, right there. but. Um, uh, one way I might answer it is a countercultural kind of thing to say, but I might measure it in terms of fun, uh, which is, I think, the, the, what I've experienced today and, and hearing from uh, a lot of the teachers and students, the, the idea of the joy of learning being something that is, uh, is and should be central to what we're doing, and um, in a way bridging this conversation where you know, students often feel like they have to say, when you say, how are you, they say stressed, or I'm working hard, right? And this was true at Harvard, too. Every kid would, would feel like they had to say it back. I would just love someone to say, I'm having a great time. You know, I love this job. It's completely fabulous, um, and it's totally fun to be in this, uh, in this learning journey with, uh, 
uh, with all of you. Um, and I believe that many of the faculty here are here because it's fun and because you know, you're willing to put in these extraordinarily long hours and travel all over the world and do these great projects because ultimately there's a, there's a joy in it. Um, and that's not something we'll ever measure. That's on the mystery and magic scale. Um, but I actually think having something that is serious fun, it's got all of the seriousness of purpose that Andover's always had academically and is absolutely in no way a diminishment of that commitment, but also just brings joy and fun uh, along with it. So it might be a crazy answer, but it's true. <laughs> Sir. Uh, uh, <coughs> I'm Tony Harry, class of 1950. And uh, I haven't heard any comment today about an issue that I think could be very important, which is in the history of the digital revolution, there's always been a very strong tension between those who are trying to profit from new ideas in this field and those who think they ought to belong to the public domain. And Tony, will you just point a little bit more toward you? The yeah. mic, yeah, there like you go. That? You got it, perfect. Yeah. So uh, you can read about John von Neumann at the Institute for Advanced Study and how he took ideas that were developed by the people at the University of Pennsylvania developing their supercomputer back in the late 40s and early 50s and how they blamed him for stealing their ideas. And then you've got the, 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 the Steve Jobses and the, all the others who are in Silicon Valley making fortunes and you, you've got Tim Berners-Lee who thinks that it all ought to belong in the public domain. And I think you've been discussing some possibilities mm. here which could have very uh, significant commercial applications. And I could foresee problems where somebody in your big group, which is get, getting to be quite large, wants to take hold of that for profit, while the rest of you want to use that for everybody. And uh, it seems to me that this is a serious problem, potentially. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Tony, thank you. I'm going to call on two people for this, if I might. Um, I thought maybe the president of the board of trustees might think about that from the perspective of <laughs> being a fiduciary of the institution. It's also someone who I think has straddled the worlds of for-profit technology and the non-profit of Andover. And then I'm going to ask uh, Professor Dr. Urs Gossers, the man sitting right in front of you, a distinguished intellectual property professor um, with a lot of experience in this field, maybe to talk about open versus closed in the context of, of your work, if that's okay. Thank you for that hot potato. Anytime, <laughs> boss. <laughs> Thank you for also bringing up John von Neumann. I think he was the person who also said, there's no sense in being precise when you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Peter, can we just say you have fabulous socks on? Those things are awesome. <laughs> I'm going to pay for that so later, I think. <laughs> we are in the intellectual property business. It's what this place does. Um, I knew more about this. Somebody, you mentioned recency in terms of memory. When I had just read John's book on intellectual property, I, I would have given you a better answer, but it, it was two years ago that I read it. Um, I don't know what we're going to do about intellectual property. I mean, some, we have been asked the question already. It's come up, so your, your question is spot on. Uh, in terms of the Khan Academy work that Bill and his colleagues have done, we've been asked, is it branded? Or have we given it away? Do we have some claim to it? And the answer is no. We've, we've put it out there under the Khan Academy brand. So we're new to this. We don't know how to do it. I, years ago, Ted Sizer, one of the things that he tried to get the faculty to do, I mean, I was his student, not, not anywhere close to the faculty, let alone the board then. Um, he thought that each teacher should write his or her own text and teach classes. So that, was, that would have been their intellectual property. Um, I mentioned Harvard this morning, the business school, and their <laughs> business model includes the sale of case studies to every other business school. Um, I think we need to be open to, to, to what we might do. I think, I think there are commercial opportunities that could come out of some of the work at the Tang Institute. I don't know what those look like. I don't know whether they're meaningful or not. But I think we'd be on the one hand, irresponsible not to consider them. And they be, they, I expect that to be a completely, if it, if it so transpires, it would be in a different structure, in a diff different form. It would be separate and apart from this not-for-profit education. Um, but are there revenue streams? Yeah, we have multiple revenue streams today. I mean, we have a summer program 
poor kids that nets us a million bucks a year. So there may be something that comes out of it that, that, that we should be open to, but it isn't the purpose of it. I mean, I'm, I'm reacting to the first question. Um, do we have one goal or a small number of goals, and how do we know if we've made them? It's a, it's a really hard question. I, I think the goal here is a process. If the legacy of the, if, if the, legacy of the Institute is um, to create a culture of experimentation that really works, great. I'd, a, I'd actually flip the goal and ask the question, are we an institution that learns quickly? Have we created feedback loops through the work at, at, the, at the Institute where we can say, we are a really fast learning organization. We can adapt, learn, collect the feedback. We, we have all the ends plugged in so that we really understand what, we, what we've learned when we run an experiment. So I don't know how to measure that goal because um, I think it's a process, not a goal, and, and, and processes always need to be improved. But anyway, now I'm just avoiding the IP question. <laughs> I have some strict IP-like answers. I won't give them now, but maybe, Professor Gosser, do you mind uh, being put on the spot for a moment for your, your thoughts on how, how you might advise an institution like ours to think about this, this challenge? Thank you, John. Um, first, you. congratulations to all of you and, and to, to Andover. This is a fantastic project. I could be more delighted uh, to be here. Uh, so I'm Urs Gasser. I'm with the Berkman Center. Um, I think the question depends very much um, what, how you define the role of an institution such um, as the Andover um, uh, project or, or the Tang Institute for that matter, right? Do you look at it as a business? That's one angle, yes, there are business model issues involved. And, and then, of course, the question is, uh, if you take a, a more closer look at it, uh, what kind of, what's your business model ultimately? And the impression I got today from, from the descriptions, even thinking about you know, the scaling and, and sharing out with the world what's happening here, that this is a service model. You, you're, you're providing a service. You're not selling case studies. You're not selling books uh, uh, or the intellectual property. W what you're creating here is a, a very... Uh, yeah, you're creating 3,000 math problems, but the, the value you add and the business models uh, that, that you have in place, I guess, uh, it is people from all over the world who want to be part of this space and this location and these relationships and the mentorship they receive here and the peer learning and the peer teaching uh, that they experience. And so I'm not saying that IP is not relevant. Of course, it's highly relevant. So the question is absolutely important. Um, but I think that the answer may be more nuanced than just the black and white use uh, of IP. Um, so that's, that's the first point I wanted to make. But the second one that I think is, is kind of closer to at least what we're trying to do at Berkman is, okay, there's the business model question, but then there is also the question of values and commitments. Um, how do you want to uh, contribute as a community to the world and, and give back? And I think that's where, where some of the open access uh, approaches uh, play a really important role because they're ultimately a value commitment um, and a statement of what we want to give back and how we together want to build a better world. world. And that goes far beyond IP issues, obviously. Professor Gosser, thank you so much. I appreciate that. If we might move the mic down to, I think, Catherine Toussignon, did you have, uh, oh, oh, okay, we'll go back here and then Catherine to you next, thank you. Uh, I'm Susanna Jones, class of 1977. Welcome back. Nice thank to you, see it's you. great to be here. So first of all, I want to say that I think this is really, really fabulous. This is what I had really hoped that Andover would do in terms of taking a leadership role in the world of education that I think is appropriate to who the school is. But my question is this, um, Aaron said that, um, not everybody at Harvard is is on the same page as far as innovation and experimentation is concerned, excuse me. <clears throat> and my guess is that's true of the faculty here as well. So my question is, how have you started to think about how the Tang Institute is going to move from what might be sort of an outbreak of excitement mm. to this being perhaps not epidemic, but at least endemic? in the community, because in my own experience, that's what's really hard, is there are people who are really excited, they're your, you know, your, your, 
your f first experimenters who are out there doing it, and then it's hard to make the leap to getting more people involved. Uh, so I don't know if you're even close to that or whether you've thought about it, or maybe Aaron can talk to that in terms of how that's worked at Harvard. I'd love to have Aaron talk to it, maybe Caroline uh, comment on it. I would just say my own reaction, I, I, one of the reasons I love working here is I have a sense that this is a faculty that's really hungry to do its job absolutely as well as we possibly can. And that's not to say everybody wants to change. There are lots of faculty members who are just fabulous at what they do and will continue to do that, and I actually think that's good. I think one of the great strengths of the school is actually the varying set of methodologies applied to teaching and learning and I want to embrace that, not just change it. I think it's ultimately getting at what Peter's talking about in terms of the culture, um, ultimately broadly. But for maybe some more specific responses, Aaron and then Caroline. So in our first conference, uh, university-wide conference, a professor from the business school, Young Mi Moon, talked about a distribution. And, and she said, you know, you have the people at one end of the distribution that are always going to be experimenting and trying new pedagogies. And you have the people at the other end of the distribution who probably will never want to do that. But really what you want to pay attention to is the vast number of people in the middle. And how do you get to the, what, what you're implying, the, the kind of the tipping point of reaching enough of those, of those individuals that you're seeing a quicker uh, pace of curriculum change, of pedagogy change, that it's meeting the demands of students at a, at a time scale that is what you were implying. And, uh, you know, I think there is no better model that I've seen than an, a, a, an organization like this one, which is part of the institution and also able to be a little bit separate from the institution for reaching that middle part of the, of the distribution. Um, for, from my perspective, um, what I find exciting about this model is the idea of a planning year. So um, this first quiet year has been about reaching out to different kinds of faculty members um, and much of what I have uncovered is that there's a tremendous amount of innovation that's already happening here. Our talented faculty are thinking about these ideas, they're doing them on their own, uh, and many of the conversations that I've had are not about, oh, I've got this proposal in mind, but I'm doing this really exciting thing, and my next step is, how can I help you build it out? How can I help you share it in some way? And so in my mind, that is a, a first step towards kind of building that community. Um, I also feel as though in this first year, um, we just opened it up for conversation and ideas, and we got a tremendous amount of ideas, and we continue to get them over time. And as these different projects grow, we share them, we amplify them, and we figure out how they work, I think that will bring in more and more faculty members and more and more student voices. Um, there is, there is a challenge, and we are still certainly at the beginning, um, figuring out how to accommodate and reach uh, and feature all those different ideas. But the connection points um, between some of the early projects, I think, already demonstrate um, how creative our faculty is um, at this stage. And I hope that we'll continue to see that grow. And as we get the mic over to, to Catherine uh, and Doran and others here, I, I might just add one uh, answer as well. Is there a mic runner who possibly could get it? That'd be great. Thanks, Sean. Um, which is, I see uh, Charlie Nesson, a fabulous professor also from Harvard back there. And there's a book um, that's been the most important book in our field of cyber laws inscribed to Charlie. And it says, to Charlie Nesson, for, every, for, who, for whose every idea seems crazy for about a year. Um, and Charlie was the person who had the idea of the Berkman Center, um, and I think people thought it was crazy for probably longer than about a year. Um, but I think the ripple effects of that institution, much like Hilt and other things, I think uh, maybe it's just I'm a uh, cockeyed optimist, but I just feel like this is the kind of thing where people will get excited about it, they will get the, the gist of the Charlie idea um, that's out there, and will just be attracted to it. And, um, and I think we can make something that will have positive ripple effects and be a node in the network that, um, that Aaron just described. Uh, Catherine, do you have a mic? So just a, a couple of thoughts about, um, you know, the question of output and um, our hopes. I, I, I guess I don't know about the idea that we're in the intellectual property business. Even if it's true, I don't know if that's a helpful phrase. And I, I agree with Peter 100% that an emphasis on process is probably more truthful and helpful as we teach students to think about education. What is it and why are we 
doing this. I think we're in this moment right now that privileges economic language above all others. And I, I really worry about the effect that that has on our students because we are a school. There are clear financial exigencies that the trustees are responsible for. But the more language we use to encourage students to think about themselves as commodities in a marketplace or to think about education as a series of transactional relationships, um, the more we lead students to feel dehumanized. It's, it's a reductive way to talk about their actual experience and it does not feel good because we're also a community. You know, we live together and there's a family connection among the people who live here and the students will have lifelong bonds with each other. And, and if, if we teach them to think about education as, again, um, a product that they are purchasing or that they are hoping to exchange in the transactional process of college admissions or that the purpose of education is to become a certain kind of worker in the marketplace only or even primarily, the more we rob them of the possibilities of fun and joy and living a, a rich, complex life of fulfillment and contentment. So I think, you know, our, our school motto is non sibi right? That we try to teach them about a meaningful life is a life that's connected to people through a lens of selflessness. And the language of the strategic plan is very aspirational. And I hope that, that the very visible adults can, can watch their words. And we can really mindfully choose language that helps our students feel fully human and complex and nuanced in all kinds of ways. Thank you. I can treat that as a comment as opposed to a question. Thank you. Jordan. Hi, Doran Weber from the Sloan Foundation, a colleague of John's with the Digital Public Library of America and a big fan. Um, Aaron, I really like what you said about um, teaching and how little we know about it, and humility was um, refreshing. Uh, and I share your views, but as a funder, you know, we're constantly being pressed to how to evaluate. So one question is, are you doing any work, or is it possible, do you think, to get it closer to, I mean, you can't evaluate what, to define what learning actually is whether it's different kinds of intelligence from emotional to moral to creative to the standard IQ or whether even from a scientific point of view in neurobiology, you know, some people say that every time you bring up a subject, like we're talking about this now, learning takes place in the brain. It doesn't matter what you say about it. You know, a certain number of neurons are being marshaled at this moment for all of us to think about something and that's a form of learning and if, and, and if you can extrapolate from that. So I'm just curious if you're doing any work on actually defining what learning is. And maybe Aaron, you go first, and then Rachel, do you mind speaking to this to some extent from the Andover perspective as you oversee institutional research? Thank you. Yes, we're doing work. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and lots of us are doing work. So people in Hilt are doing work, people in the psychology de department are doing work, people at the ed school are doing work. Lots of work is happening within courses at the level of institutional data, at the level of um, uh, of, of students. Um, the only answer that I've come up with, because each, each uh, sort of disciplinary lens on these questions is limited, and each data source is limited, is to do uh, a multi-method approach, and to approach learning, especially general ideas of learning from lots of different points of view and triangulate to, to understand how to define it. It's not, it's not satisfying, but it's the best I think we have at this point. Thank you. I'm going to throw the hot potato to Rachel. In the, in the spirit, really, it may, not have, may or may not have specific things you want to say on that topic, but um, one thing I would love for us to be in the business of here at Andover is really partnering with others who are trying to answer this question, whether it's at a foundation. Each foundation now has an assessment department, in essence, um, or at Harvard or other universities. There are many other wonderful universities not represented on the stage right now who have thoughts on this, um, but how we might be a node in that network as well uh, in terms of trying to bring the best of assessment here to Andover. Sure, I wanted to talk a little bit about the idea of um, big data being messy data. And uh, we're a big school and old school, and we have a lot of information about um, outcomes. And so part of the work of the, the Office of Institutional Research is how are we learning from that information? And so in the context of something like the strategic plan, um, for instance, we have a goal of taking a look at our daily schedule and annual calendar. So we're talking about 
vertical time within the day and then horizontal time in terms of an annual calendar. And um, we have larger goals in terms of the strategic priorities, for instance, uh, empathy and balance. So if we put together a new schedule, how do we determine whether it's a good one or a bad one? Um, how do we figure out how to assess it and what do we learn from feedback? And so to your point, we don't really know yet, but we have some theories. So for instance, um, with the psych center, um, which is an integration of our mental health um, and also our medical buildings, um, the hope is that perhaps with more time, kids will use that building more. Um, partly joining them together is to get away from the stigma of kids going and getting mental health um, support, which we think they need to do. But would they use it more? Or are there other things within the plan that we're doing that would actually make them need to um, have them use it less? So we don't know. Um, but I think in terms of connecting our strengths, which is what we're, we're calling the plan, not only are we thinking about the learning that the kids need to do, but I think it's just as important for us as the adults um, to think really carefully about what we're learning, how we're learning, and putting together a feedback loop so that we don't assume that the way we're initially going to assess something is the right way. Rachel, thank you. Yep. I'm just going to add one thing. Great, and if there's it. one more comment or question, we'll tee that up and uh, Just one more wrap piece up. on this assessing. Um, which goes back to an earlier question, too. If you think about it, grades, those are all really good <laughs> right now. Level of courses, those are all really high right now. Um, how students are doing when they leave here, they're doing really well in college. So we're at this wonderful moment where all of the traditional indicators seem to be working. So we're drilling down to find the new indicators. And that also is exciting, and we're role modeling that we don't have all the answers. We're role modeling for our students that we're learning, and we're learning collaboratively, and we're learning with our networks. We're participating, we're producing, and networking. Um, and I think the kids like seeing us do that too. It's, uh, as we go to our last comment or question, it is a fascinating thing, to, it's very true at Andover, certainly was true at Harvard, that you know, we determine that grades are the indicator of student success, right? Over time, the grades go up, as they do in all these schools. Grade inflation, as we know, is you know, always going up. And then we have you know, faculty meetings where we wring our hands about the grades going up and grade inflation. It's such a funny cycle that we've gotten ourselves in that we actually are giving the kids better grades. Maybe that's an indicator things are going better, and yet we worry about grade inflation. It's totally sensible, and yet, on the other hand, it's totally nonsensible. So, Can I add one more thing? Um, and just in terms of networking, as part of the strategic planning process, we have these implementation working groups. And so we're looking at things like advising. We're looking at things um, like our postgraduate program. And part of that process is reaching out to other schools or other institutions who, may be, who are doing the same work and may be a little ahead and some of what they're doing in evaluating their processes. And so in terms of a back and forth um, and partnerships, as much as we hope that other schools can learn from us, there are a lot of schools that are doing the same kind of work. And so um, we can save a lot of time collaborating instead of just being in a bubble and trying to do it all ourselves. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, last question or comment. Hi, my name is Kim Gazowski. Um, I have a lot of questions and comments, but I will try and Great. keep it very. That's because we have one minute short. left in the entire program. <laughs> Great. So, uh, I'm an alumni from Andover. I used okay. to teach here. I, was, I also worked with Kelly Wise in the IRT, and I'm related to various Andover people. So I've watched Andover's progress over the past 30 years since I was a student. Um, and I work in education on a lot of these questions that you're attacking today. And on the issue, I'll the one question for me, um, there's a lot of them, but one of them is on the issue of assessment and grades. What I keep wondering, and I work with students who are helping develop curriculum, and I work with professionals who are not in education who like to come in and guest teach, and every one of us keeps wondering, why are we training so rigorously from so young the skill of test taking not to say it's useless, but it is a skill that we are training over and over and over again. But as adults who are not in education, we do not take tests. My test every day is whether or not what I do is useful for you and whether or not what you do is useful for me is the 
grade. It is, and one of my deepest questions right now around evaluation, I'm hearing this big mystery, but how can we, and is Andover addressing this, develop a, a way of educating that really is looking morally, philosophically, and assessment-wise at useful? Yeah. Did your wall stand up? If it did, then your geometry was good, as was your carpentry. It's a great question. Um, that there's some clapping for that, I can tell. Um, let, me, let me take that one, if I might, just as uh, from an institutional perspective, and then we'll maybe wrap up, since we've held you in this windowless, beautiful, but windowless room for four and a half hours, and it's a well, lovely I'm sorry, fall and John, day. I would yes. also say I loved hearing you talk about joy, and I think Thank the joy you. is in when we feel useful. Thank you. And when yes. we feel that what we're doing is not sitting in class wondering why the hell we are here, because we don't understand why it's useful. Well, I, I totally agree that that is a big part of our enterprise, is to make kids feel like it's useful and, it, and it's wonderful. I would say we are talking a lot about assessment in a variety of ways, and, and, and the, I hope Tang is to be part of it, but there will be conversations, there are conversations outside of it. Um, certainly I can speak for the ones that I've been having within, uh, with some colleagues in the history uh, department as an example. Um, you are no doubt familiar with the distinction that many people draw between formative assessment and summative assessment, so for those who are not in this debate, the idea is there's a very big distinction from doing an entire term worth of work and then at the very end, in a summative sense, testing somebody. Um, that's the same theory behind the SAT or MCAS or anything else that um, one might use. And the idea of using assessment as a way to uh, ensure that a kid is learning along the way and to form the, uh, the, the opinion. Um, I'm a huge fan of formative assessments and very little in the way of summative assessments. Um, I think an example of that in terms of Andover, we, we heard at the beginning of the day that Andover is one of the schools that helped found the AP system, and that's that's actually true, but we actually don't really teach AP classes here anymore. Why? Because we didn't like the idea that you have to teach so much biology, right, to cram into the mind of a kid so that they will take a, a biology class. Is it just as hard um, as the AP biology ca class taught at another school? Absolutely. Um, but is it much more focused on a formative approach rather than a summative approach? Absolutely. Um, and you know, so many teachers I see in the room here who um, who operate in this in this wonderful way. Um, so no question, but that that's uh, I think one of the key questions um, that we would like to, to try to answer. I think if you asked also our group in admissions um, about their thoughts on this, the de-emphasis on we do not admit all kids who get 99s on the SSATs by any stretch of the imagination. And you know what? We could. We could fill the class two or three times over with kids who are the best test takers. That's not our approach to education on the way in, and it's not our approach to education um, as we do our work every day. And I actually think part of why this is a wonderful uh, opening and why this uh, the Tang Institute, I think, is uh, such a great project is we have to give another answer, right? We have to give another answer and say, what is education about if it's not getting a great score on a test? And I feel like all of the little bits of information that we have shared today and the, the many hopes that we have shared today are about trying to answer that question, is really to, to get, as Catherine has in, in multiple settings on the stage, just pushed us to say, what is education about? Let's be fundamental about it and really um, push hard at that. And then every day, let's do really well at it. Um, and let's do really well at it in all these different disciplines and all these different ways. Um, some of which we know perfectly well, and some of which you know will emerge over time as we experiment and as as we try it. And I think that's really the great promise uh, of what we have here ahead of us. Um, I'm going to bring this in for a close because we are at time. Um, I want to uh, close first by by just a, a very large set of thank yous. I can't thank individually everyone, but um, we've been uh, supported today by our team from AV, who's up here and has done a wonderful job. Um, we've been supported by our friends from ImageThink, um, who have been uh, standing there all day drawing beautifully, and I urge you to take a, a peek at all of what they've done. Thank you. Um, we've been supported by so many staff and so many faculty, um, all of the panelists, of course, all of the donors who have supported um, the Institute already, of course, uh, to Oscar Tang for his um, deep generosity and the, the wonderful gift that, that names the Institute. Um, and I want really fundamentally to thank um, all of those who will be faculty fellows initially in the, in the uh, Institute, those who will work on it uh, over time, and particularly to uh, Caroline and Eric, who will be working day to day in the Tang Institute and end over. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming and participating and with the hopes that you will stick with us even after that initial glow has gone that we're going to be pushing at this for years and years. We've been at this for 237 years as a school and I hope we will be at it for nearly as long as the Tang Institute at Andover. Thank you all for being here.